I am seeking, searching for the things this world has rejected, the things that are broken, that are flawed, thrown away and discarded. I seek the lost, the damaged, the forgotten things, the overlooked and the neglected, the things that have been pushed aside and left behind. Why? Why do I do this? Why chase after that which is despised by so many? It is because I have chosen the rejected. I bring restoration to the broken. I see beyond the flaws and the imperfections and I bring new life to the lost. This world has called them useless and garbage. Hopeless and unwanted. They have been scarred, abused, ignored, and unloved. But I, I have reclaimed them. And they belong to me now. They are my masterpiece. And I have a plan and a future for every single one. For I am crafting these dissonant and discarded pieces into something beautiful. How many times do we, or have we, made excuses as to why we can't do something or be someone in our lives? Think about that. How many times have we made excuses as to why we can't do something or be someone in our lives? And where did it get us? Nowhere, right? In fact, excuses, they keep us they deter us from our destiny in Christ. And the enemy uses excuses to keep us from that purpose and from God's plan. Let's, let's read some, some sayings about excuses this morning. Excuses will always be there for you. Opportunity won't. I like that. Excuses are for people who don't want it bad enough. That ought to be scripture. That's good stuff. Make excuses or make changes, the choice is yours. That one sounds really familiar, doesn't it? That one sounds familiar. Brandon, Misty's brother, loves to say, hey, you want to make excuses or do you want to make a difference, right? Let's do it. Let's get the job done, right? Let's look at the next one. This one's good. Make yourself stronger than your excuses. It's good. But this next one's my favorite. I love this one. It says, excuses are like, armpits. Everyone's got them and they all stink. Isn't that good? <laughs> and it's so true. Excuses are like armpits. They, we all have them and they stink. It really, it really doesn't accomplish anything by allowing excuses into our lives. I remember a long time ago, early on in my life, I learned this and my kids get sick and tired of hearing it because I share it with them often. And that is, guys, every excuse is equal because they produce the same result, right? What is the result? Mission not accomplished, right? Progress not complete. We didn't get the job done. It didn't happen, right? So we use excuses, and, and, and as I told you before, you know, the enemy loves to use those excuses to try to keep us from God's plan. And uh, today, we're going to talk about God's plan. We're going to talk about excuses a little bit. We're going to talk about shame and how the shame can come off again in part four of this series, Shame Off. And this is actually the grand finale uh, for this series. Now, uh, I, I, want to, I, I want to read this to you. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down because this is so powerful. I'm going to, I'm going to let you in on a little something about God, a very powerful fact about your Father in heaven. All right? This is what He thinks of you. 
No matter how beat up your past may seem, God wants to repurpose you for his pleasure. Isn't that good? No matter how beat up, no matter how messed up your past may seem, God wants to repurpose you for his pleasure. God takes so much joy in taking things that are messed up and turning them into a masterpiece. He is our master in heaven, and he is an unbelievable craftsman and artist. He loves to take your life, he loves to take my life continually, and he loves reshaping us, molding us, using us. He loves repurposing us for his pleasure, all right? I want to tell you a story real quick. As most of you know, I am a man but not a handyman. (laughs) I am not much of a mechanic. I know where the mechanic shop is, and I do my job as a man to take my vehicle there when it needs help. I'm not a carpenter. Although I have been involved in carpentry projects, I actually worked as a carpenter and got fired. I'm not a carpenter. I, I just, I'm not, I'm not, I'm an artist. I can draw, I can, I can make pottery, and I can, I can write music. I can do lots of creative stuff, but I'm not a handyman. I am not a handyman. But I, in high school, believe it or not, I was in shop class. I think it was required. I think it was a choice between that and like child development where we had to find out about the different stages of birthing or something. I don't know, but it was a good option. And I remember taking that class, and I loved it, to be honest with you. I love the smell of that sawdust, man. I love all the wood and stuff and all that good stuff that they have in wood shop. And we did these projects. We'd make salt and pepper shakers, and we'd make all this sorts of really cool stuff. And for the final project, they let us choose what we were going to build. And, and, and even though I wasn't a handyman, I wasn't really carpenter-like, one of my favorite shows that I enjoy watching, all my 90s people, Norm Abram, The New Yankee Workshop. Anybody remember that show? Raise your hand if you remember that show. That was an awesome show. Norm was the bomb. Norm was a carpentry rock star. He was unbelievable. He could take a plank of wood and turn it, just nothing, and turn it into something absolutely beautiful. And it, it just, it amazed me. Every time he got a hold of a piece of wood, he would turn it into something amazing. So I watched this one show where he took all this pallet wood, right, all this pallet wood, it was all beat up and it was old and it was really just going to be burned. It wasn't good for anything. And he turned all this old pallet wood into this beautiful, beautiful coffee table. And I thought, man, I want to do that. And so I told my shop teacher, I said, I'm going to build me a coffee table out of pallet wood. He said, all right, bring it in. So we tore all the wood apart and he kind of guided me through the process. And I built me a really beautiful Yes, a really beautiful coffee table with absolutely no structural integrity whatsoever. None. I was like, don't put your feet up on it. (laughs) It's it's not going to last. And actually, I held on to that coffee table uh, through my single years into my marriage, brought it into the marriage, had, had plans, had every intention of passing it down to one of my sons. Every intention. I loved that table. I was so proud of that table. Sorry? That we don't have anymore because there was a church rummage sale and Misty felt the ministry of selling it for $10. I know that it meant so much For $10, she sold the table that I had slaved over. I had worked hours and hours and hours for weeks, for even months on end for my final project to make that table. I was so proud of it. I had taken all this trash wood and turned it into this beautiful masterpiece of a coffee table with no structural integrity whatsoever. I, I remember was asking you when we got married. It's and not your story. You, hold on. It's my it's, story. Well, I'm jumping and in, I'm in a on this moment story. of passion. All right, hold on. So I remember when we, before we got married, like the few pieces of furniture you had that we were going to like not trash. Well, that was one of them that you really wanted. And I remember we put it in front of our little love seat and I was like, where did you get this? Like, yeah, like, let me tell you. Where did you get it? You know, this came there were some little little cracks in between the pallet yeah. wood, you know, and I was like, where did you get this? Those like are a yard sale? Routered edges, <laughs> lady. Only to find Routered out you edges. had 
built that yourself. It was awesome. But after a couple years of seeing that beautiful piece in our house, it was time Just to go. Little- All things have a season. It was its season, baby. We do have a picture of it for your children. Do we really? No, I'm lying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if I don't have a smartphone, I would have taken While one. I'm dying. <laughs> Just go ahead and push me under the water. Just, just drown me in my weary dreams falling apart, destroyed. So anyway, here's the point of that story. <laughs> God loves taking all beat up, messed up people like you and me. And he loves making something beautiful out of us. He loves repurposing us for his pleasure. He loves taking a messed up life like me. And he loves making us into a masterpiece for his glory so that he can be glorified. And that's what today's message is all about. It's getting that shame off and it's realizing that God wants to use you no matter what your past, no matter what your past, God wants to repurpose you for his pleasure. Now the word of God is full of stories about men and women who their lives were full of shame. And you can see God repurpose them for his pleasure. But there's one in particular that we wanted to share with you today. And you might not have even heard this story. It's not told very often. And you know, isn't it awesome how the Old Testament, if you read it, it's mostly names that you cannot even possibly come close to pronouncing, right? So you give it your best shot. This is one of those names, all right? This is a guy by the name of Mephibosheth, all right? From here on out, Mephibosheth. You got to say it really fast 10 times and mess it all up. From here on out, I'm going to refer to him as Mr. M. Much easier, and my tongue can handle it better, all right? His story is found in 2 Samuel chapter 9, and I'm going to kind of tell you about this guy, all right? This guy's life was full of shame. The interesting thing, though, in some cases, just like people today, at no fault of his own, he had not done anything to have made himself be in the position he was in. But yet his life was full of shame. I want to read for you this story, beginning in verse 1, 2 Samuel chapter 9, if you have your word. And it says this. And one day David asked, and David is the king of Israel at the time, is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? I'm going to pause right here and bring you up to speed. King Saul was the first king of Israel, and he had a son by the name of Jonathan. Jonathan and David were best friends. After King Saul died, David took the throne. Normally in that day and time, when a new king ascended to the throne, every single person in the previous king's lineage was wiped off the planet. They were all killed. And that's just how it was, because in that day and time, nobody, they didn't want anybody to come back and try to take the throne from now their family. And so there's one guy left. There's one guy, and David was such great friends with Jonathan. He says, hey, is there anybody, is there anybody left in the kingdom who was related to Jonathan and King Saul? I want to bless them. And there's this servant that used to work for Saul named Ziba, and they brought him in before King David, and he said, there's one guy, Mr. M. I happen to know where he lives. I'm going to go get him and bring him to you. So he goes out and he brings him back in before King David. And we're going to pick up in verse 7 and it says this. Don't be afraid, David said. Again, I remind you, what did they do with people from the previous king's lineage? They killed them. So obviously, when he was summoned to come to the king, he would have been a little bit nervous as to whether or not he was going to be leaving his presence or getting his head cut off. David said, don't be afraid. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat at my table, the king's table, for the rest of your life. You can read the rest of the story, but what's amazing is David follows up by showing him such amazing favor. He says, listen to me. I'm going to give you everything that was the inheritance of your family. Not only that, I'm going to give you 20 servants to work the land and farm it for you so that you'll have an inheritance. And on top of that, you're going to come and you're going to eat at my table and you're going to act like one of my sons. Now you think to yourself, well, that doesn't seem very shameful. Well, where's the shame come into this whole story? Well, let me tell you, if you go all the way back to the age of five, 
Mr. M was five years old when his grandpa and his dad were in battle and they were both killed. And in that time, because everybody in that lineage would have been wiped out, his nurse picked up this little five-year-old and took off to run. And when she did, she dropped him. And from that day forward, he became crippled in his legs. He wasn't able to walk. And in that day, imagine if you were a man and you couldn't work, the shame you would feel. You couldn't provide for your family. And so he not only is crippled, but now his entire family has been wiped off the planet. It's only him, and he lives in fear every day as to whether or not he is going to be killed. But what's interesting is God had a completely different plan. Not because he did anything to deserve it. Not because he did anything to deserve it. But listen, what Mr. M was doing that so often we do is he was looking at his current circumstances. And he was looking at his past circumstances. And he was living a life of shame because of those two things. He wasn't at all looking forward to say, what could God, the God of Israel, the God that my father and my grandfather served, what could he do in my life? Could he take the shame off and repurpose me for his pleasure? He wasn't looking at that at all. He was so wrapped up in my life stinks. I have been dealt a bad hand. And so often, that's how we feel in this life. We feel like we can never become anything because we've just been dealt a really bad hand. I want you to look at 2 Corinthians 5 and 7. It says this, For we live by believing and not by seeing. You see, God wants you to get your eyes off your circumstances right now. He wants you to get your eyes off of your past. And start realizing that God has a future for you. That the word of God tells you that he has a future and a hope for you regardless of your past. You know what I love about this story is, is there anything that Mr. M could have done to have earned or been granted the favor from the king, from King David? Is there anything that he could have done to have earned that favor that he experienced? And the answer is clearly no. There's nothing that he could have done to have caused David, King David, to show mercy on him. The reason King David showed him mercy and kindness and love when he was shamed by not not only everybody that, that looked at his life, but he experienced shame. He had shame on himself. There's nothing that he could have done. And in the same respect, God says, you know, there's nothing you can do ever that will impress me enough to get my attention and get me to show you the favor and the kindness and the love and the affection because we are all guilty. All of us. All of us are guilty. You know, Jesus died on the cross. God's only son died on the cross and that impressed God. Unless you're willing to do that. And even if you did, It wouldn't mean anything because it's already been done. So there's nothing we can do to earn the rewards of God's love and his mercy and his forgiveness and his faithfulness to us as his children. There's nothing that we can do. I love this story because you look at this guy who had so much shame. He was without hope. He had zero hope of ever becoming anybody. Zero hope. Perfect opportunity, perfect environment, perfect circumstances for God to say, now look, I can do something with that. Something that is completely without hope, I can bring hope to that life. That's what God wants to do with you and me. Isn't that awesome? You might be like Mr. M. You might say, I, you know, I've come to God and I'm completely crippled. I feel like in my life, that my legs have been completely knocked out from under me. I feel like I, like I just can't even walk. I feel like I'm completely dependent, right, on other people in my life to keep me encouraged just so I can keep on going. Imagine what he felt like. Well, is that you today? Maybe, maybe you'd say, you know, I feel like I'm living in Lodabar. I feel like I'm living in a dry, desertous wasteland of a life. I feel like... Like I'm literally just going to burn up to death and, and, and die of thirst. I feel like there is nothing for me in this life. I want to tell you, I want to remind you that God is the God that brings and puts streams in the desert. He brings 
Fresh water to desert places. That's the kind of God that we serve. So it doesn't matter what your life looks like now or what it looked like before. The fact is, is God wants to set you up on your feet. And he wants to give you a purpose. And he wants to give you a hope. And he wants to bring nourishment and refreshing, cool, cold water from the waters of life. He wants to give you life. And he wants to give you a purpose again. See, it doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what your story is. It doesn't matter what people say about you. It doesn't matter what people think about you. God says the shame needs to come off. The shame needs to come off. He wants to repurpose you for his pleasure. No excuses. They're all equal. No excuses. God wants to use you. There's a, there's a couple in this church and this is going to be really encouraging to you. We see a lot of people come, you know, their lives are messed up. And God just begins to mold them and make them into a masterpiece. Just would blow your mind, you know. And there's a, there's a couple. I want to show you this video here in just a second. There's a couple that's one of many that we've seen come through the doors of this church. And God has just grabbed a hold of their lives. And he's changed them and he's shaped them with purpose for his pleasure. I want you to watch this video. I'm TJ and this is my wife, Megan, and we started attending Mountain Movers Church in December. Our life when we first started attending MMC was, we thought was happy, but now that we realize it was a fake happiness, um, a lot of basically bad decisions one after another. My life was, especially me, a lot of drinking alcohol. Both of us were into drugs, um, pills, marijuana, a few others that won't be mentioned. We decided to start attending Mountain Movers Church because one night I basically thought that I was going to die and I wasn't ready to face death. We were awake for days, Megan and I, and basically I hallucinated and I thought that I was going to die. Um, I knew that standing in front of God, I, it, I was terrified basically. I wasn't ready for that moment and I knew something needed to change. My mom mentioned Mountain Movers Church and I realized it's right down the road from where we live. So we showed up here on Sunday. When TJ asked me to come to church with him, I was kind of not too thrilled about it. I haven't had the best experiences with churches. And I drugged my feet, but came and I haven't wanted to stay home a day since. The type of shame that we were carrying before we came to Christ was uh, basically just living for the moment um, unguided, not really any direction at all in my life whatsoever. I had no plans. Um, I was just beat down by reality and I accepted my fate and uh, not really planning on changing at all. Um, I was just angry at the world all the time. Reality, you know, hit me in the face and kept me down. And I really did feel like I wasn't ever going to be good enough to be loved by God. And uh, now I realize that that's all, that's all a lie, basically, from the enemy getting in your head. And now that we have a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus, um, I know that I'm now truly happy. Um, it's really hard to get me down. And... Uh, <clears throat> It's just better knowing that um, I'm now ready to face death like before I wasn't and now I just I'm not really that scared about it like I used to be because I know what's going to happen and um, we're a lot more active than we were a lot more active actually. And uh, we laugh a lot more. <laughs> There's more to laugh about when you're sober. Yeah. <laughs> And we really, truly love each other. We feel like we have a purpose. It's nice to feel needed and wanted somewhere and feel like we're actually doing something with our lives for 
a better cause than being selfish for ourselves. And uh, it's just way more fulfilling and more happy. Because you feel more loved for who you are and not just for who you are to somebody. It's awesome to know the uh, depth of God's love is like unending and you're always in it and it's it's good to know that it's good to feel that because he was emotionless before I was yeah I like, was didn't cry nothing yeah very straightforward no smiles really not very often but now I'm just a lot more happy and I feel like I'm kind of outgoing compared to how I used to be. A lot of people might think that I'm a mute, but to me it's way different. You lose a lot of friends, but you gain a lot more, a lot more. Yeah. Better yeah. friends, friends that are actually there for you and not there for yeah. whatever drugs or alcohol you have. An added bonus to coming to Christ is I believe he's healed my body. Um, the odds were against me having a child because of a couple of health issues I've had. But Two weeks after we first attended Mountain Movers Church and truly repented of our sins, she finds out she's, what, four weeks pregnant? So we consider it kind of a miracle. And the shame that we carry now... The shame is off. Shame is off. TJ. And I'm Megan. And we're living proof that God's still in the business of moving mountains. Woo, can you just give a hand for that amazing story? You don't know TJ and Megan. They are truly, completely new people. I, I remember the first time that they shared their story and they came to our Newcomers Life group, which we normally have Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, and you can meet with us at 6.30. And that's why we love to do that. We just want to know people's background and, and where you came from. And when they shared that story, we were like, everybody needs to hear your story. Everybody. Because, and we saved it. We've been saving this story for today for the finale because what better day to show that God can totally take a life when they felt like they had no direction and no purpose and that God could not possibly love them and God took the shame off. They practically live here now. They do. They're, they're here. here all the time. They're like three or four nights out of the week. They're here. But you know what? They live with purpose now and that's what God wants to do. He wants to make you a brand new creation. You know the most classic scripture in all the word of God is John 3 16 and it says this for God so loved the world. God so loved TJ and God so loved Megan. God so loved you and he so loved me that anyone that would believe on him would repent of their sins would inherit eternal life. We don't have to live any longer with the pain and the burden of shame. That comes straight from the enemy. He wants you to be burdened down. He wants you to have no purpose and no focus. He wants you to live for yourself. But listen to this. We're going to end today on this. 1 Corinthians 5 and 7. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old is gone. The new has begun. Will you stand with me this morning? God wants to give you a brand new life. God wants to take you. He wants to wipe the shame away. I'll never forget years ago. Brad and I lived in Joplin. And we started a bus ministry at a church plant we were helping. And the first little girl that I picked up on my bus, she was a 12-year-old little girl. I'll never forget. Her name was Becca. She might be watching. And Becca was 12, which is my daughter's age. And Becca had been raped three times by family members. And Becca dealt with so much shame. It broke my heart. I wanted to just take her home with me, and yet I was like 20. I couldn't really help her that much. I mean, I was a young single girl, but my heart was broken because her life was so impacted by someone else's choice. And you know, there may be junk in your life that you're dealing with, just like her and just like Mr. M. It was of no fault of your own, but you've got shame in your life. Or maybe you've got shame in your life because of your own choices, because of the things that you have done, the things that you have said, the things that you've got yourself addicted to. But I want to tell you today, God wants that shame to come off of you. Will you bow your head with me this morning? I want to remind you that this series is all about a new beginning, a fresh start. The enemy wants you to be bound by guilt and shame, but Jesus gave his life 
so that you could be set free, so that you could be forgiven and released of that bondage. This morning, I just want to pray over you, and I just want to ask God to remove the shame from your life. Father God, I thank you, Lord Jesus. God, that your word is so incredibly clear and inspiring. God, that you have come that we might have a life and have it more abundantly. You did not come to condemn, but you came to save us. God, to set us free. Father God, I pray, Lord Jesus, God, that the shame would come off of each and every individual under the sound of my voice. God, I pray that they would realize, God, that they would look up and they would set their sights upon you. God, that they would not set their sights upon the circumstances around them. That they wouldn't look at their past and their past mistakes and their past failures and the things that maybe they had nothing to do with but that has brought shame into their life. God, I pray that you would cleanse them today. Take the shame off of us. Repurpose us for your pleasure, Jesus. With heads bowed and eyes closed, This is our favorite part of the service that I was talking about earlier. This is the moment where you have been given an invitation by God to have Jesus join you on your journey in life. This is an opportunity to know Christ in a real and a life-changing way. This is an opportunity to gain hope in your life. To have heaven as your I'm going to count to three, and on the count of three, if, if you say to yourself, Pastor, I, I need Jesus. I want to have a real and life-changing relationship with Him that is contagious. I want to know that I know that I know that I have heaven to look forward to, that I have eternity secured in Christ. If that's you today, I'm going to count to three. On the count of three, I want you to raise your hand, and we're going to pray with you as a family. We're going to agree with you And we're going to welcome you into the family of God. Here we go. One, two, three. Would you raise your hand if that's you? And that goes for those that are watching online. Amen. I see your hand. Anybody else this morning? That goes for you watching online as well. Whoever you are, God loves you. And God is calling you and He is drawing you by the power of His Holy Spirit. This is is your day. This is your moment. Would you pray with me? Repeat these words after me and let's pray as a family. Father, I love you. I thank you for Jesus. I know that I have fallen short in life. I've sinned against you, God. But I pray that you would forgive me. Wash me clean of all my sins. I believe that Jesus is who He says He is. I confess with my mouth that He is Lord. Help me to please You, God, in everything I say, do, and think. Repurpose me for Your pleasure. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Would you celebrate with us today? as we congratulate those who have come to Christ this morning. Amen. God is good. Hey, thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online, or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. Or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma 74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.